All right, we are back. Um, we're going to be talking about a really important trial that's happening right now that I don't think many people are really covering or talking about. Um, this is really like, I, it's, I think, one of the biggest uh, trials in the history of the CIA. And it's just like there's such little coverage on that on it like that it just makes you kind of scratch your head and go hmm are there things coming out here that maybe they don't want people to know about so uh this video is called one man versus the cia the biggest trial you haven't heard about which is the case um before we get into that though i just want to quickly remind everybody that uh if you could if you're interested Make sure that you like the video, subscribe, hit the little bell so you get notified every time I put out a video. If you want to hear about the topics like this, uh, sort of breaking news things that maybe are underreported and you're not going to hear about really anywhere else, especially not on YouTube, that'd be great. Also, share the video, comment. That helps boost it in the YouTube algorithms. Um, I'm automatically now being demonetized and YouTube is messing with my videos. I'm having trouble uploading videos at all if I don't select to unmonetize it. Like it's saying it can't run um, like uh, copyright checks or whatever. So it, it takes the publish button and it turns it like gray. So I can't publish video. There's a lot of weird stuff going on with my YouTube channel right now. So if you could uh, make sure that you're subscribed make sure you're following me on my other uh, platforms i have all that stuff now linked in the video description so you can follow me on my socials on twitter uh, gab nicecrew.digital wherever so that way you can always get in contact with me you can send me a dm or whatever and talk to me but also i have ways to support my channel listed there as well um, i prefer if you want to support my work that you use my paypal um, so that you don't have to give money to Google and YouTube. We're not happy with Susan, okay? <laughs> We're not happy with Susan, and I actually don't know how long this channel is going to continue to exist. I already have one strike. I'm two strikes away from losing the entire channel, and there's a lot of weirdness going on, as I said, with, in regards to the channel. So moving on, let's talk about uh, Joshua Schalte. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name wrong. From the beginning of my coverage of Vault 7 and uh, Mr. Schalte's case, I have been referring to him as Schalte. You know, it could be Schult or whatever. I like to call him Schalte. I think it sounds better. You know, I just like it. I've, gr I've grown accustomed to calling him Schalte. Joshua Schalte. So that's what we're going with. It is what it is. But I'll just give a quick rundown for people who have not been following this trial. Um, back in 2017, WikiLeaks released what was known as the Vault 7 files from the CIA. This was their internal hacking tools, their cyber tools. Uh, and a lot was revealed about the types of um, operational capabilities that the CIA has. And some of this stuff was, you know, regular things that you would think any sort of uh, intelligence agency would have, but some of the other tools were very questionable. And it made it very clear that the CIA has the ability to bypass encryption so they can access things like Telegram, um, Signal, uh, any uh, so-called encrypted platform, and they have access to all of that stuff. Um, and they're able to gather and listen to like audio, video, like they can turn on your computer they can turn on microphones on your cell phone like they have a lot of things they're able to do but they can also falsely attribute hacks to other organizations like iranian hackers they can leave like Ar iranian fingerprints or russian fingerprints on a so-called hack right that's important when we think about the dnc alleged hacks i mean a lot of people have talked about that being seth rich and it being an internal leak um, we don't really know, you know, I don't trust anything as far as like what the FBI told us about that. They didn't even really properly review it, in my opinion. They outsourced that to an outfit called CrowdStrike. You know, Sean Henry has ties to go the government, and um, it's just very questionable how that was handled. And then there's the whole Guccifer thing. Very weird stuff going on there, but that's getting off topic. Coming back to Vault 7 and the CIA... And Mr. Joshua Schulte, who 
uh, is the alleged leaker. We don't actually know if he leaked this stuff or not. The CIA claims that he did. Um, Mr. Schalte also has a separate charge, not just for the leaking, but uh, for CP. If you know, you know. I, I can't say what it really is. But what is disturbing to me about that is we, we don't know if that's real or not because we know that the CIA can plant that stuff on people's devices. So if he was a target there at the CIA internally of this is the person we think was doing this, we need to manu manufacture a pretext to be able to go in and seize his devices, right? That could have been one way that they did it. So I covered this trial when it first happened and um, it ended in a mistrial. And strangely enough, they're retrying him again. He's being held at the Metropolitan Correctional Center in New York City, the MCC, as it is colloquially referred to, uh, under what I believe are torturous conditions. He also did not have proper attorney-client privilege. He was not allowed to speak privately with his own attorney. The CIA had to have a liaison that would act as sort of like a gatekeeper. And the CIA is the one that's basically the opposing party in this case. So they they were like basically running stuff and, and managing everything, which is totally unfair. So let's look at an organizational chart from the CIA, just to give you an idea of how massive this intelligence agency is and sort of how out of control and totally unaccountable. There's no transparency. There's no accountability uh, with the CIA. But just take a look at this organizational chart. And I believe that some of this was learned through things that came out with Vault 7, possibly, possibly not. But you have intelligence here and look at all the subdivisions of that. School for Intelligence Analysis, Weapons Intelligence and Nonproliferation and Arms Control Center, Transnational Issues, Terrorism Analysis, uh, Russian and European Analysis, Policy Support, Near Eastern and South Asian Analysis, Iraq Analysis, Corporate Resources Collection, Strategies and Analyses, Asian Pacific, Latin American and African Analyses, Information Direction Center slash Analytical Group, Counterintelligence Center slash Analysis Group, and at the top, Crime and Narcotics Center. That was under the Intelligence Branch. Uh, looking at the Director at the top, you have the Deputy Director, Associate Deputy Director, Chief of Staff, Executive Secretariat, analytic support team, executive support staff, protocol, and then branching off of that, you have general counsel, congressional affairs, public affairs, inspector general, associate director for military affairs, CFO, CIO, chief of human resources, uh, diversity hires, uh, operations center, strategy management, diversity plans and programs. Oh, that's super important. Equal opportunity employment policy and corporate coordination, Foreign Intelligence Relationships, DNI, Open Source Center. Now, under clandestine service, what you can see is attached to the directorate here, uh, Deputy Director NCS. Under that, Counterproliferation Division, Counterterror Center, Counterintelligence Center, Regional and Transnational Issues Divisions, Technology Support Divisions. Deputy Director NCS for Community Human, Community Human Coordination Center, Science and Technology, Business Strategies and Resource Center, Center for Tech Management, Chief Scientist, Development and Engineering, Global Affairs, Mission Manager, Special Activities, Special Communications Programs, um, Systems Engineering and Analysis, Technical Collection, Technical Readiness, Technical Service, and over at Support, you have Strategic Resource Investment, Critical Mission Assurance, Support College, Non-Traditional Support, NRO Programs Manager, DNI Program Manager, Corporate Business, Global Infrastructure, Global Services, Medical Services, Mission Integration, uh, Personal Resources, Security. That is not all of the CIA. This is just a limited window into it. There's far more, so many other divisions uh, of the CIA. So they're just a massive, massive uh, agency that ha operates 100% uh, in the dark. There is no ability to look at what they're doing. And the CIA has brought us such gems as MK Ultra, MK Naomi, MK Delta, uh, horrible things that came out during the church committee about what the CIA was doing, infiltrating newsrooms, not only here in America, but around the world and distributing and disseminating propaganda. There have been things that former directors of the CIA have said, such as, you know, when the American people, when everything the American people believe 
is essentially wrong, right? When we can get the American public to believe that black is white and white is black, we'll know that we've accomplished our mission. You know, and it's interesting too, like the the fact that the the left used to be very like cautious of the CIA because of uh, operations like um, Operation Chaos, which was run domestically by the CIA in the 1970s, targeting uh, predominantly left-wing groups. They're not supposed to be operating domestically. They're supposed to be operating in the foreign sphere. Um, however, they were never held accountable for that. Like, nothing was done to stop that. So I presume that their domestic operations have actually only increased, especially when they work with the FBI and their counterterror, their ability to operate domestically. They, the FBI has CIA liaisons right now we have all these dhs fusion centers 72 of them across the entire united states they have their people everywhere and i'm telling you that not just in newsrooms but also in uh universities like literally everywhere in psychology in medical and the cia has actually admitted this that they have people basically everywhere you know it's definitely here in the united states in other professions. So somebody could be a psychologist, psychiatrist, but also be working for the CIA. And it's sort of like once you're, you're CIA, you're always CIA. So now that we have that background sort of out of the way and just talking about why the CIA is a problem, you know, here's the other thing. They're running around conducting color operations, uh, color revolution type operations, toppling, um, you know, people like governments <laughs> around the world and installing their own puppets they're running narcotics trafficking in many cases to fund their black operations creating death squads in latin america there's a lot of really awful stuff that the cia is responsible for and um you know i think we have to question uh a lot of that so let's move on to um Mr. Schalte. Let's look here first at the Vault 7. This is from WikiLeaks. Vault 7 CIA hacking tools revealed. Um, this is their press release. Today, Tuesday, March 7th, 2017, WikiLeaks begins its new series of leaks on the CIA codenamed Vault 7 by WikiLeaks. It is the largest ever publication of confidential documents on the agency so as you can imagine this caused a massive uproar within the agency of how dare somebody you know try to hold us accountable or provide some transparency about what we are doing especially after you know we did experimentation on human beings uh, during mk ultra drugging them trying to brainwash them in many cases causing people to go insane destroying you know lives and families that's sort of what they do the first full part of the series year zero comprises 8761 documents and files from an isolated high security network situated inside the cia center for cyber intelligence in langley virginia you know it's really important to point out here like, we only know about MKUltra from financial documents, mostly. Um, a lot of that, the documentation regarding what the, the CIA was doing with MKUltra and other programs like that, they were shredded. Um, there, were, there were financial documents that were obtained that kind of gave us a little bit of information about what were, they were doing um, from that, but it's, it's a very small window into it. We have no idea the extent, the breadth of what they were doing with those types of operations. And they claimed that they ended MKUltra, but what they typically do is just roll it out under another project name. And so you can imagine sort of if they were able to brainwash people in such a crazy way with MKUltra, basically reprogramming people. Um, and now it goes back to the 60s. I encourage people to read the book by Dr. Jose Delgado about how to reprogram the human mind and basically create like a, a mind control person. That was in 1967 when that book came out. Imagine what they're able to do now. The technology has improved to such an extent that I believe they have these sort of Manchurian programs going, Manchurian candidate type programs running uh, in far more than that. I think that they use things like social media data analytics to literally like um target groups of people and shape their the way that they think and what they're seeing like i think they have the ability to like curate that individually 
you know, to manipulate people, to nudge them in certain directions. And I think it's far worse than that. I also believe that many of the big tech companies are tied to the CIA. In fact, we know the CIA has what they call InQtel, their own venture capital firm in Silicon Valley that is funding many of these big tech companies. In fact, Google itself has its start in a joint CIA NSA research grant. So they call these private companies and they get to bypass things like FOIA because they are private companies. But I guarantee they are totally part of the intelligence apparatus and basically uh, another branch of the federal government for surveillance um, you know, look into Total Information Awareness, a program from 2003 that was supposed to have been shut down uh, to understand like what I'm saying here with this. And just go look at InQtel's portfolio. They openly display what companies they're investing in. And, and it's not just tech companies. It's like biotech, genetics uh, companies, crazy stuff that like the CIA really has no business being <laughs> creating and like investing in. And it just really makes you wonder because it's not really disclosed. Like if you didn't know that, you'd have no idea that Google is basically part of the CIA and that's where they're, they come from, that that's literally their grant. That's how they got started was this grant from the government. If you don't know this stuff, if you don't look for it, you're never going to understand. But InQtel lists its portfolio of what it has invested in publicly on their website. I encourage you to just go peruse that and you're going to be like, wow. It's shocking. Moving on, though, the first full part of the series, quote unquote, year zero comprises 8,761 documents from their cyber intelligence in Langley, Virginia. It follows an introductory disclosure last month of CIA targeting French political parties and candidates in the lead up to the 2012 presidential election. So is the CIA manipulating elections around the world and basically picking the people that they want to run other countries? That is an insane amount of power, isn't it? Recently, the CIA lost control of the majority of its hacking arsenal, including malware, viruses, trojans, weaponized zero-day exploits, malware remote control systems, and associated documentation. This extraordinary collection, which amounts to more than seven, several hundred million lines of code, gives its processor the entire hacking capacity of the CIA. The archive appears to have been circulated among former U.S. government hackers and contractors in an unauthorized manner, one of whom has provided WikiLeaks with portions of the archive. Quote unquote, year zero introduces the scope and direction of the CIA's global covert hacking program, its malware arsenal, and dozens of zero-day weaponized exploits against a wide range of U.S. and European company products, including Apple's iPhone, Google's Android, and Microsoft Windows, and even Samsung TVs, which are turned into covert microphones. Every smart TV in every household in America is a microphone and possibly a camera for the CIA. Think about that. You understand that that's worse than the East German Stasi. All right. Since 2001, the CIA has gained political and budgetary preeminence over the U.S. National Security Agency. There is sort of a rival with the NSA and the CIA. The CIA found itself building not just its now infamous drone fleet, but a very different type of covert globe-spanning force, its own substantial fleet of hackers. The agency's hacking division, freedom from having to disclose its often controversial operations to the NSA, its primary bureaucratic rival, in order to draw on the NSA's hacking capabilities. By the end of 2016, the CIA's hacking division, which formally falls under the agency's Center for Cyber Intelligence, or CCI, had over 5,000 registered users and had produced more than a thousand hacking systems, trojans, viruses, and other weaponized malware. Such is the scale of the CIA's undertaking that by 2016, its hackers had utilized more code than that used to run Facebook. The CIA had created, in effect, its own NSA with even less accountability and without publicly answering the question as to whether such a massive budgetary spend on duplicating the capabilities of a rival agency could be justified. Look into shadow brokers. 
In a statement to WikiLeaks, the source details policy questions they say urgently need to be debated in public, including whether the CIA's hacking capabilities exceed its mandated powers, absolutely, and the problem of public oversight of an agency rogue and out of control. The source wishes to initiate a public debate about the security creation, use proliferation, and democratic control of cyber weapons. Once a single cyber weapon is loose, it can spread around the world in seconds to be used by rival states, cyber mafia, and teenage hackers alike. Julian Assange, WikiLeaks editor, stated, quote, there is an extreme proliferation risk in the development of cyber weapons. Comparisons can be drawn between the uncontrolled proliferation of such weapons, which results from the inability to contain them, combined with their high market value and the global arms trade. But the significance of year zero goes well beyond the choice between cyber war and cyber peace. The disclosure is also an acceptable exceptional from a political, legal, and forensic perspective. Exactly. WikiLeaks has carefully reviewed Year Zero disclosure and published substantive CIA documentation while avoiding the distribution of armed cyber weapons until a consensus emerges on the technical and political nature of the CIA's program and how such weapons should be analyzed, disarmed, and published. WikiLeaks has also decided to redact and anonymize some identifying information in Year Zero for in-depth analysis. These redactions include tens of thousands of CIA targets and attack machines throughout Latin America, Europe, and the United States. While we are aware of the imperfect results of any approach chosen, we remain committed to our publishing model and note that the qual uh, quantity of published pages in Vault 7 Part 1 Year Zero already eclipses the total number of pages published over the first three years of the Edward Snowden NSA leaks. And was that the first shot across the bow at the NSA by the CIA? that we're coming after you and we're going to make you obsolete and we're going to create our own NSA. You have to ask that question, don't you? It is very interesting. Because for people who don't know, Edward Snowden worked for the CIA before he worked for the NSA. Just put that out there. <laughs> so this says CIA malware targets iPhone Android smart TVs. Just lovely stuff here, guys. <laughs> and CIA's mobile devices branch. So all these different units inside the CIA, CIA wow, malware targets Windows, OS X, Linux routers, everything. CIA hoarded vulnerabilities, zero days. Of course they did. Of course. Unreal. Cyber war programs are a serious proliferation risk. Of course they are. U.S. consulate in Frankfurt is a covert CIA hacker base. Well, that's good to know, isn't it? Unreal. <laughs> How the CIA dramatically increased proliferation risk. So all of this, by the way, will be included in the video description, the links to every source that we're looking at today, so you guys can look at this yourself. Evading forensics and antivirus. So just to make it easier for them to basically be able to spy on everybody. A series of standards lay out clown malware infestation patterns, which are likely to assist forensic crime scene investigators, as well as Apple, Microsoft, Google, Samsung, Nokia, BlackBerry, Siemens, and antivirus companies attribute and defend against these attacks. Wow. CIA hackers develop successful attacks against most well-known antivirus programs. Yay. All right. So then they get into some of these different Techniques like Umbridge, the CIA's handcrafted hacking techniques, pose a problem for the agency. Each technique has created forms a fingerprint that can be used by forensic investigators to attribute multiple different attacks to the same entity. This is analogous to finding the same distinctive knife wound on multiple separate murder victims. The unique wounding style creates suspicion that a single murderer is responsible. Uh, as soon as one murder uh, in the set is solved, then the other murders also like find likely attribution. The CIA's remote devices branch, Umbridge Group, collects and maintains a substantial library of attack techniques stolen from malware produced in other states, including the Russian Federation. So putting Russian fingerprints on hacks... With Umbridge and related projects, the CIA can not only increase its total number of attack types, but also misdirect attribution by leaving behind the fingerprints of the groups that the attack techniques were stolen from. Umbridge components cover key loggers, password collection, webcam capture, 
capture, data destruction, persistence, privilege escalation, stealth, antivirus, avoiding, and survey techniques. Fine dining comes with a standardized questionnaire, i.e. a menu, that a clown case officer fills out. The questionnaire is used by the agency's operational support branch to transform the request of case officers into technical requirements for hacking attacks for specific operations. It's very lovely. Improvise is a tool set for configuration, post-processing, payload setup, and execution vector selection for survey exfiltration tools supporting all major operating systems. Hive is a multi-platform clown malware suite and is associated control, its associated control software. So there's so many, so many things here uh, that it's just really, it boggles the mind. Um, we have the Vault 7 projects. Each thing is looked at here like Brutal Kangaroo. You can go ahead and look at all of that. Um, Hive, Weeping Angel, Archimedes, After Midnight, Athena. You can look at each one. There's documentation for this. It's just, it's stunning. So now let's look at my prior reporting on uh, this. And I, I was talking about the Shalti case as well as the Julian Assange case. So this is an article I wrote um, from February of 2020, two critically important legal cases playing out right now with massive implications for the notion of freedom of the press and the line between protecting national security and legitimate secrecy versus the public's need and right to know. We've seen the U.S. Department of quote-unquote justice target whistleblowers to make examples out of them, yes. Likewise, the weaponization of the U.S. intelligence community for political and commercial gain. 100%. So this was the Vault 7 uh, case. The first case is the U.S. versus Joshua Schulte, the alleged leaker of a repository of hacking tools the clowns use that WikiLeaks has dubbed Vault 7. So, uh, yeah, of course, we can expect little or no mainstream media coverage except government-approved talking points. Yeah, exactly. Um... Okay, so it, I'll just read part of this to give you some background. The criminal trial, Josh, Joshua Schulte, a former CIA employee accused by the government of leaking documents exposing illegal global spying operations, began in a New York federal courtroom this month. Hearings are ongoing. 31-year-old has pled not guilty to 11 charges. They cover alleged violations of the Espionage Act, including the theft of government property and illegal transmission of unlawfully possessed national defense information. Proceedings provide a glimpse into the kind of kangaroo court that Julian Assange will face if he is extradited from Britain to the U.S. to face trumped-up Espionage Act charges over separate 2010 and 2011 WikiLeaks publications, and that is in fact happening. He is being extradited. He will face the same kangaroo court show trial that Schulte is facing now. If Schulte is convicted, it may also aid the attempts of the DOJ to concoct further charges against Assange on the grounds that he violated U.S. national security. The corporate media is seeking to suppress any public discussion of the Schulte trial, of course, a handful of reports in the New York Times, Washington Post, and other prominent publications have said virtually nothing about the assault on whistleblowers revealed in Schulte's treatment or the content of the material he is alleged to have leaked. It is as if Edward Snowden, the whistleblower who came to international prominence by exposing the U.S. NSA surveillance operations, were on trial in New York and the media didn't bother to show up. And isn't that interesting, too, the difference in how Edward Snowden was received and turned into this sort of hero and how Schalty has been treated and received in the same press. In 2017, WikiLeaks publications based on material Schalty has alleged to have leaked, exposing CIA spying, were no less damning. No, they were far more damning than Snowden's revelations. U.S. prosecutors have stated they... Uh, constituted the single biggest leak of classified national defense information in the history of the clowns in America. Dubbed Vault 7, the documents detailed the activities of a secret division within the CIA responsible for offensive hacking operations. They revealed the agency to be the biggest purveyor of malicious computer viruses in the entire world. Among the most explosive revelations were documents showing the CIA division would, after hacking into a computer system, leave telltale markers in foreign languages, including 
including Iranian and Russian. This pointed to the way in which supposedly forensic evidence of things such as Russian interference in the 2016 U.S. election could have actually been manufactured by the CIA. Gee, maybe that's why they don't want people tuning in to this trial and paying attention. The trove demonstrated the CIA had developed capabilities to hack household appliances, including smart TVs, so they could be used to spy on their owner. It contained evidence of even more sinister operations. One document showed the division was seeking to develop the capacity to remotely take control of the computer operating systems of cars. Such capabilities could be used for assassination operations. Look up the death of Michael Hastings, the journalist, the Rolling Stone journalist who was working on a big expose of John Brennan, the former director of the CIA, whose car drove into a tree at a, over 100 miles an hour, exploded in the engine, was ejected uh, over 100 feet in a fiery crash. Yeah, crashes of convenience. Isn't that interesting? The illegal character of these activities, which violated the U.S. Constitution and potentially infringed on the right to privacy of millions around the world, has been covered up by the media and the official political parties in the U.S. and around the world. Instead, Schulte and Assange have been viciously targeted. WikiLeaks publication of Vault 7 in early 2017 was followed by a frenzied hunt within the CIA for the whistleblower. It was the trigger for a major intensification of Washington's pursuit of Julian Assange. They even discussed assassinating him. This culminated in the increasingly U.S.-aligned Ecuadorian government's expulsion of Assange from its London embassy last year and his detention in Britain. One wonders about journalists who have passed away under suspicious circumstances like Michael Hastings. In 2012-13, to 13, Hastings was allegedly working on a major story on CIA director John Brennan and his witch hunts on investigative journalists. An AP uh, spying scandal at the time showed the U.S. intelligence community under the Obama administration had been targeting whistleblowers and setting traps for them as well as journalists. Concerned he was being investigated by the FBI, reportedly Hastings had just reached out to WikiLeaks attorney Jennifer Robinson when the fatal car accident that caused his death occurred. Of course, Marcy Wheeler empty wheel and people like Alexa O'Brien see this in a very different light. They are lackeys of the national security apparatus. These are the leftists who now champion the CIA and the FBI. Schulte's defense claims the CIA system was not secure and the CIA targeted him as targeted him as a scapegoat because of the issues he had with some co-workers. And by the way, one of these co-workers was a diversity hire. That's interesting. Jake Hamby, a former Google employee, says, speaking of the CIA, this Vault 7 WikiLeaks uh, leaker trial is fascinating. I think they caught the guy red-handed, forensically speaking, so I'm curious to see what his defense will be. He's basically the Edward Snowden who got caught. I don't want to make any predictions at all about what the jury is thinking because the details of the forensics from just... One day of testimony I read were pretty intense for a non-technical audience. Thinking about Linux commands from his uh, dot bash, underscore history, IPs, etc. I remember there was a lot of speculation around the time of the Vault 7 leaks as to how Russia or some adversary had found these presumably CIA files. Well, by the Fed's own admission, they are real and it was an insider leak by a disgruntled employee. Guess who hired Joshua Schalte, the defendant in the Vault 7 Leaks trial after he left the CIA? None other than Bloomberg, senior software engineer. I'm sure it paid well. I wonder if Bloomberg is hiring Android engineers. I don't want to move to New York City, but I might if it paid really well. I'm not going to shill for him on social media, but his company has a particular product with a lot of fun engineering challenges. Um... Interesting Bloomberg connection, of course. Empty Wheel reveals herself as a champion of the torturing CIA. Yes, twice she claimed WikiLeaks and Julian Assange release of Vault 7 burned CIA to the ground. This attack comes in a week of Julian Assange's extradition hearing. She places herself with Gina Haspel's mob. Yes, isn't that interesting? Alleged WikiLeaks whistleblower Schulte on trial in New York. The court hearings over the CIA Vault 7 leaks exposing clown spying and hacking have been subjected to a near total media blackout, of course. Yes, exactly. Vault 7 revealed encrypted platforms are pointless when the underlying operating systems are already compromised. Indeed. 
So they were not allowed to subpoena Mike Pompeo. Isn't that funny? Short, Schulte's lawyers are claiming there's been a Brady violation due to the so-called missing discovery hard drive that the Metropolitan Police Department in New York City reported. Yes. Isn't that interesting? Prosecutors withheld evidence. Of course they did. Of course they did. So I have some more stuff in here about how Julian Assange is being persecuted as well. Um, moving on to my other article on this chaos in the court, strange happenings in the CIA Vault 7 leak trial. This was from March 5th of 2020. Within the past few weeks, strange things have been observed with respect to the U.S. versus Joshua Adam Schulte, case being tried in the Southern District of New York, New York with Judge Paul A. Crody presiding. There's been a total mainstream media blackout regarding the case, particularly unusual as this case has major implications for national security and freedom of the press. Top secret CIA virus control system hive. Alexa O'Brien is an independent, uh, independent investigative journalist in the so-called expert in the U.S. versus Bradley Manning case and is one of the few independent journalists covering the Schulte case. She's put together a very detailed master timeline and created a transcript and exhibit library online to make source files and transcripts available to the public and easily accessible. That is one thing I credit her for and that I appreciate that she's done because that is something that is really, really important. If you're gonna be covering this stuff, you need to be able to access the transcripts and exhibits and all of that stuff costs money and it takes time to put together. The case has been failed in secrecy from the outset along with the media blackout. Schulte claimed he is being subjected to isolation and torture. Kieran McCarthy reports for the UK register, Schulte has not been given proper due process and his rights are repeatedly violated. The lawyer for former CIA employee Schulte is unhappy. The spy agency is allowed to review communications with her client before she gets it and has accused the agency of trying to intimidate her. Schulte's lawyer, Sabrina Schroff, who, by the way, I reached out to and never got a response from, appeared in the New York court on Wednesday and argued the CIA was abusing attorney-client privilege as well as threatening her with future legal repercussions for receiving confidential material. Quote, the CIA essentially has threatened us, Sharoff told the judge, asked whether the spy agency was also listening in on her confidential conversations with her client. She responded, we don't know. Of course they are. The CIA believes Schulte was behind a massive leak of material from the spy agency that outlined how it is able to install spy software on laptops and phones, but has been unable to prove the assertion. Schulte is currently in jail on unrelated charges of possession and distribution of CA images, CP, but the CIA has made it plain. He is the prime suspect in the information leak. Schulte was in charge of a server that contained 54 gigabytes of illegal content, but has pled not guilty, arguing he was running a public server and had no idea about the images. Thanks to his work for the CIA's engineering development group and the spy agency's suspicions he was behind the leak, he and his lawyer have been put under extreme restrictions. Indeed, another independent investigative journalist for Inner City Press has been reporting on the horrible conditions at the MCC where Schulte is currently being held. Most recently reported conditions are that the MCC has been on lockdown uh, uh, over claims of a smuggled gun, quote unquote, and inmates had not been allowed to meet with attorneys, bathe, or even eat a hot meal for the past seven days. There are other related cases going on simultaneously in the UK, the extradition hearing of Julian Assange of WikiLeaks and the US versus Khalid Sheikh Mohammed trial being held at Guantanamo Bay. Ex-employee of the UC global spying firm contracted by Sheldon Adelson on behalf of the CIA. And what is, hello, why is Sheldon Adelson, who, by the way, is no longer with us, thank goodness, but what is he doing contracting for the CIA? Testified in court yesterday, the company staff proposed extreme measures like poisoning or kidnapping Julian Assange. And by the way, this is what the CIA's torture program looked like to the tortured. Drawings done in captivity by the first prisoner known to undergo quote-unquote enhanced interrogation. Yeah, these lovely euphemisms for torture. Portrays his account of what happened to him in vivid and disturbing ways. For more information about that, I include the link to the article that shows uh, at least 14 different images of how they torture people. And it's not just physical, but psychological torture, and it's absolutely brutal and disgusting. 
Two of the lead CIA torturers became embroiled in a vicious turf war for mastery of the enhanced program. Quote, unquote, in that struggle, detainees were used as bargaining chips. The two men had them tortured for training or demonstration purposes. Joshua Schulte claims he was bolted to the floor naked in the shoe at the MCC and subjected to torture. Considering a number of bizarre courthouse incidents and the government and prosecution being generally unresponsive to, de to defense questions, focusing mostly on Schulte's behavior in prison, one could easily conclude that the forensic case is weak. Now it's being reported there are problems with the jury. Empty Wheel has also been covering the case and claim in an article entitled, Joshua Schulte Jury is Falling Apart. And remember, she is a CIA lackey. Even before Judge Paul Crody dismissed a juror today for reading outside information and sharing it with another juror, it was clear the jury was a mess. Going all the way back to February, a jury had something said something to another juror that concerned him. The court, okay, I got a note from a juror and it deals with an incident that occurred on Thursday, late in the day, that, that he then left the courthouse. We asked him to put the report that he made to David on Thursday in writing, which he did. This is the note, I'm going to market court exhibit one. Mr. Schroff, it is, Ms. Schroff, it is, it's her belief. She's not saying she can't be impartial. She's not deliberated. She's voicing an opinion. She also notes that that was a different, I mean, she's saying she's a different kind of citizen. That's what we want, a jury of peers. So it's interesting. All this weird stuff going on. So she got booted. She seems to believe Schulte did restore his own access to certain files. Given her description, she seems focused on brutal kangaroo, but does not believe he is guilty of the most serious charges. So they had to get rid of her. Part of the problem jurors are having, in my own personal opinion, is believing anything that comes out of the government at this point. After uncovering the torture, Jeffrey Epstein's death, and Spygate revelations, all in just recent months, it appears the government views itself as above the law. Exactly. QCIA Vault 7 leaker uh, Joshua Schulte is held in a rarely used form of extreme solitary confinement called special administrative measures that keeps him from communicating with pretty much everyone and puts his lawyers in constant fear of being prosecuted themselves. Therefore, members of the defense team factor the SAMs into every case-related decision, attempting to steer very clear of the ambiguous line. The SAMs draw between zealous advocacy and actions the government could deem a threat to national security. This compels the defense team to constantly weigh Schulte's interest against their own, creating a potential conflict that would deprive Schulte of his right to representation that is free from conflicts of interest. Exactly. Schulte's lawyer has made a request to meet him one week prior to any meeting. He's then transferred to a special secure area that is monitored by CCTV before being strip, sh strip searched and chained to the floor. His lawyer is not allowed to take in any equipment and must use a government supplied computer to review any material con conditions imposed by the judge. Despite specific provisions that prevent jail staff from recording any audio or sharing information with the prosecution, Shroff suspects the CIA is monitoring her meetings regardless. Of course they are. It's a government issued computer, guys. Come on. She's frustrated. The court ordered that any material produced by Schulte is first reviewed by the CIA before she gets it. So she can't even, <laughs> he can't even give her discovery. Like she's his own lawyer and the CIA is managing that. And the agency seems to be going out of its way to delay access as well frustrate her efforts to provide him with a defense. We are experiencing significant delay in the CIA's process of classifying our client's work product, she wrote to the judge in March, giving the example of one document that had taken more than two weeks to be cleared. We asked the court impose reasonable deadlines by which the CIA walled individual must respond to documents given him for classification review, she argued a 10-day maximum. The government responded, saying that it had in no way it had no way to speed up the process because the CIA officer in charge of reviewing the material is independent from its prosecutorial team. In court Wednesday, the government even argued the CIA was a victim in the whole process. Oh, please. Facing criticism for doing its job protecting national security secrets, Schroff made her disagreement known. Prior to the court hearing, Schroff repeatedly informed the judge the CIA was hindering her work because the CIA insists that all of his written communications with counsel down to each comment and proposed edit to any work product must be reviewed and cleared in advance by a walled CIA employee. The walled employee had also failed to sign a memorandum of understanding, she complained, by insisting on continued edits to standard language. Schaff argued for restrictions surrounding the search warrants lodged against her client two years earlier be lifted because they contain no confidential information. 
if you don't have attorney-client privilege, I argue it's not possible to have a fair hearing. The prosecution has access in advance to all work product, all potential rebuttals, and is able to craft their narrative accordingly, so it's not fair. Um, anyways... Uh, when you get past the noise, you'll learn the CIA did not have a very secure system. While the physical location of the server was secure, and it does indeed look like a vault, the Devlin system was wide open, and the password, I kid you not, was my sweet summer. That's the CIA, guys. This is the vault. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, God, the CIA. Alleged Vault 7 leaker trial finale. Want to know the CIA's password for its top secret hacking tools? 123 ABC Def. <laughs> Tales of terrible security. Poor compartmentalization. Poor compartmentalization and more emerge from the shanty hearings. <laughs> oh, dear God. Lord have mercy. That behavior painted a big target on Shalty's back. One... Uh, one that led the CIA to believe it was definitely him who stole files when they were publicly distributed a year later by WikiLeaks long after he'd left the agency. His defense argued that same red target caused the CIA and FBI to decide he was a guilty party and then build a case around proving it rather than looking at all of the evidence and figuring out who the real culprit was. All of this raises question, though. Just how bad is the CIA's security that it wasn't able to keep Schulte out, even accounting for the fact that he is a hacking and computer specialist? The answer is absolutely terrible. The password for the Confluence virtual machine that held all of the CIA hacking tools that were stolen and leaked, that will be 123ABCDEF, and the root login for the Devlin server, my sweet summer. <laughs> It gets worse than that. Those passwords were shared by the entire team and posted on the group's intranet IRC chats published during the trial. He even revealed team members talking about how terrible their infosec practices were and joked that CIA internal security would go nuts if they knew. Their justification. The intranet was restricted to members of the operational support branch, the elite programming unit that makes the clowns hacking tools. So, gee, guys... <laughs> I don't know uh, how this could have happened. The FBI expert assessment can be viewed here. So I have some of the files uh, in here, the government exhibits. Judge Crody has decided not to grant a mistrial and has decided they will bring in an extra juror move to day four of deliberations. And that was that article. My final article on this, CIA Vault 7 leaks trial ends in a hung jury. But what of Julian Assange? This was March 10th, 2020. In the case of... The U.S. versus Joshua Adam Schulte, the CIA Vault 7 leaks trial we have been following closely and has resulted in a hung jury. While the government focused on Schulte's alleged workplace issues and his behavior in prison, the defense pointed out the weakness of their central forensic case. The most serious of the charges against Schulte were centered on gathering and transmitting national defense information, essentially spying intended to do, intending to do harm to the nation. But the government pressed their case, dissecting Schulte's alleged workplace issues and behavior in prison. On its face, the contrast is ludicrous. <laughs> a mistrial was declared in the case of the CIA Vault 7 trial. Yes, exactly. Jurors' deliberations after four days after Schulte's lawyers have asked for mistrial on all but two aligned charge, aligned at charge or a modified dynamite charge. Judge Crody told the jury to fill out the verdict sheet, blah, 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 blah. So um, they basically it was a hung jury. Reportedly, there were problems with the jury. Apparently, they were thinking for themselves and they had the audacity to do their own research rather than let the CIA and U.S. government run this as a show trial. Juror number four allegedly had gone rogue and was reading on her own. Oh, my. Juror number five was dismissed for looking into the government lawyers and doing research. <laughs> On her way out the courthouse when stopped by inner city press, she proclaimed, I don't think he did it, what they accuse him of. Not the most serious charges. He's innocent. Let the brother go. Yes, queen. Even the New York Times had to admit that the government could not tie the leak to Schulte and that the forensic case was not very strong. Nicole Hong writes, an office of the Central Intelligence Agency outside Washington turned into a crime scene March 7th, 2017. WikiLeaks had just published a trove of confidential clown documents that revealed secret methods the agency used to penetrate computer networks of foreign governments and terrorists. 
Investigate. Yeah, right. They were using it for far more than that, lady. Investigators scrambled to find the culprit, seizing more than a thousand devices from the CIA as top secret operations and computer networks shot down. Eventually, they arrested Joshua Shalty, 31, who worked as a computer engineer for the agency. But Monday, in a muddled outcome for the government, a federal jury in Manhattan could not agree on whether to convict Shalty of the biggest theft of classified documents in the clown history. After hearing four weeks of testimony, jurors deadlocked on eight counts, including illegal gathering and transmission of national defense information. They did all, they did convict Schulte on two other counts, contempt of court and making false statements to the FBI. The motivation for the alleged theft, prosecutors said, was Schulte's belief that CIA management did not take his workplace complaint seriously. That's so stupid. The partial verdict came after six days of chaotic deliberations. One juror was dismissed in the middle of discussions because she violated the judge's order by researching the case herself and the lawyers that were involved on her own and then shared that information with the jury. The judge declined to replace her with an alternate leaving a panel of 11 people. The jury also complained in a note about a separate juror who was not participating in group discussion, raising concerns about her attitude, quote unquote. The group of nine women and two men was ultimately unable to reach a unanimous verdict on the most serious charges in the case. The verdict showed the jury had doubts about the government's most important evidence, which came from a CIA server. Trial witnesses guided jurors through a complicated maze of forensic analysis that, according to prosecutors, showed Schulte's work machine accessing an old backup file one evening in April 2016. He did so, prosecutors say, by reinstating his administrator-level access that the CIA removed after his workplace disputes. The um, file matched the documents posted by WikiLeaks nearly a year later, according to the government. The defense argued the CIA computer network had weak passwords and widely known security vulnerabilities and that it was possible other CIA employees or even foreign adversaries had breached the system. Exactly. If you've been following my reporting on the case, you will know that the Times article is omitting key details. They did not mention Schulte's co-worker, who was also a suspect, nor Amal, the drug dealer that Schulte believed was a security risk. Yeah, by the way, the CIA employs people like Amal, drug dealers. The password on the Devlin system was my sweet summer. <laughs> One, two, three, ABC, Dev. I, son of a god, I swear. You can get uh, transcripts from the trial linked here. Of course, things are not over for Schulte. The next hearing in the case will be on March 26, 2020. He still has the CP charges to be addressed in a separate hearing altogether. More ominously, if Schulte did not leak the Vault 7 material, who did? And what happens to Julian Assange? So that was my article in March 10 of 2020. Now moving on, it, they delayed, 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 delayed. Now we've got the retrial, the retrial Joshua Schulte. And CIA leak trial Schulte jurors will not see WikiLeaks in redacted form. 2D in a series. Yeah, exactly. Opening arguments by the prosecutor and then Mr. Schulte himself. June 14, when jury selection was completed for the retrial of accused CIA Vault 7 leaker Joshua Schulte, the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York, Jesse M. Furman, told the jurors do not read or say anything about the case. Now, the U.S. versus Schulte juror selection on the 23rd floor, Schulte himself at a sidebar amid white noise. Judge Furman, I'm going to announce the selected jurors. He reads out 16 names. Judge Furman, your jury room will be on a different floor than our courtroom. Do not tell anything, anyone anything about the case. Now Joshua Schulte making arguments to Judge Furman before the just picked jury is brought in for initial instructions. Judge Furman says the government can propose a redaction. In some case, I'm required to accept it. That you prefer it in a different form, I think, does not cut it. The public could compare the redacted with the public one and confirm it, which the U.S. has not yet done. Assistant U.S. Attorney Denton, there are large quantities of material that is irrelevant, so page after page would be redacted. Schulte, having the large document to show how much information was released, this document is 50 or 60 pages. I need to be able to make my defense. Schulte, if it's redacted, it only tells the public that the U.S. says it's classified. It doesn't give anything away. Furman, that's a misperception. You are uh, prosecuted for giving away info of the U.S. It is relied on the fact that you never acknowledged Vault 7 or 8. Schulte, if some of those documents didn't actually come from the CIA, I need to know that. Judge Furman, Government Exhibit 1 qualifies as NDI. The question is whether you leaked it. The MCC charges are more complicated. 
Uh, that's National Defense Information, by the way, NDI. Schulte, this has never been argued before. Now the U.S. is saying some of these documents are not legitimate government documents, so they can't say it's national defense information. The problem comes back to the WikiLeaks counts. Judge Furman says we're off course. Mr. Schulte is now raising an issue I'm not necessarily going to respond to. Assistant Attorney Delton says the NDI he's alleged to have stolen and transmitted, we acknowledged it's NDI. There are parts of it that are not government documents. Furman says I agree. If Government Exhibit 1... Uh, if it's not NDI, the jury will find you not guilty or your Rule 29 motion will be granted. Mr. Schulte quotes language from the Wilson case. This this man, Schulte, is literally representing himself at this point. He's so fed up with how the CIA was trying to intimidate his lawyers, their inability to really help him. He decided, fuck it, I'm representing myself. One man against the entire U.S. government, Justice Department, CIA. Like, this is amazing. Just in and of itself that he's that that bold. Judge Furman, if a redacted document were shown to the jury, I'd tell them not to consider the redactions in any way. I grant the government's motion. This resolves the public disclosure issues, except as discussed in the classified session yesterday. So we'll bring the jury in and I'll deliver my instructions 20 minutes or so. Then Schulte can remain in the courtroom to check the technology, then openings. Judge Furman says, jurors, please rise so we can administer the oath. Furman says we'll not sit on July 1st. If you have other plans, try to conform them. Your deliberations will be secret and you will never have to explain them to anyone. Every defendant is entitled to represent himself. Mr. Schalte has chosen to do so. He will be the one questioning witnesses and making objections. My king in any arguments. There are standby counsel to assist, but Schulte controls his defense. So blah, blah, blah. Don't communicate. Don't look at the media about this. Tweeting is not harmless. Don't do it. Okay, so Inner City Press filed opposing the sealing of the courtroom for CIA witnesses. And once the witnesses begin, anticipates making other filings from Judge Furman's June 13 order as discussed on the record at the classified hearing held June 8, 2022. The court concludes a particular statement defendant seeks to admit is admissible. The court further concludes that the information should likely be admitted as a stipulation that would give the defendant, quote, substantially the same ability to make his defense as would disclosure of a portion of the document itself. Um, previously, in the conclusion of the month-long trial of accused CIA leaker Joshua Schulte on March 9, 2020, the jury returned guilty verdicts on counts 8 and 10 with a mistrial granted on all the other counts. That was before Judge Crody. All right, so let's move on. Uh, in CIA leak trial of Schulte, FBI agent cites petabyte of information and brutal kangaroo cyber tool. Day two should see Schulte's cross-examination on this witness, FBI agent Evan Check. Interesting. <laughs> okay, so the judge says, I'm going to announce the jurors. Yeah, we, we read that part. Um, Denton says, Joshua Schulte is responsible for the largest leak in CIA history and put officers at risk. When confronted, he lied. Denton says he stole custom-built software used to track terrorists. Oh, really? Is that what it was used for? Or was it used for tracking American citizens, violating the CIA's own mandate? Those files were posted on those files were posted on WikiLeaks. It was devastating. Operations came to a crashing halt. Allies wondered if their information could be leaked. No, allies wondered why the CIA was fucking spying on them. Let's get real. The FBI sprang into action. Oh, gee, they've got the FBI on the case, guys. Maybe they can entrap some more, um, you know, mentally handicapped people by telling them to put the powder into the balloon or whatever. <laughs> Denton. They found his ma this man's crimes. He hacked and leaked cyber tools. Joshua Schulte was one of the CIA's own. He built the tools. He violated his oath to protect the U.S. and he violated the law. Why did he do it? Out of spite. Denton. He felt the CIA had disrespected him. He wanted payback. His vendetta continued in jail. He got a cell phone in jail and leaked again plotted a campaign he committed espionage computer hacking and he lied to the fbi my name is david denton <laughs> okay denton joshua schulte built sophisticated diver cyber tools in a secret building with armed guards those there were vetted that they could be trusted oh so they had to take oaths to the cia not the united states by the way 
<laughs> they're loyal only to the agency, not to American citizens. I hope everyone understands that. Assistant Attorney Denton says, Shalti was made a software administrator with super access. He made backups. He falsely accused his coworker of making a death threat. Did he really falsely accuse him? Or is that what happened? Because this is one of your psychotic diversity hires that happened to be a drug dealer. But the CIA found it wasn't true. Shalti got angry and acted. Oh, is that what happened? The CIA locked it down and changed codes. Denton, but the CIA did not change one particular key and Shalti used it. He heard it too would be changed. That was the day he stole that info that WikiLeaks posted. He used a snapshot or a reversion before it was locked down. Denton, he spent an hour inside the snapshot. He used his powers and copied the entire CIA cyber arsenal. He stole a copy, a complete copy, same as was published on WikiLeaks. He unwound his revision. Shalti started deleting log files, but he couldn't get them all. You know, they have a really weak forensic case, by the way. There is no actual proof that that happened. He downloaded software to hide his identity. He researched how to transfer and destroy digital evidence at home. He tried to wipe his home computer clean. He followed the exact instructions of WikiLeaks. He took a job in New York at Bloomberg. After WikiLeaks published, Schulte lied to the FBI. Then in jail, he used a secret phone to create accounts on social media. In jail notebooks, he wrote, I will stage my information war. Okay. After WikiLeaks published, Schulte lied to the FBI. Then in jail, he used a secret phone to create accounts on social media. Eh, we just read that. Denton, ladies and gentlemen, you'll see how the agents identified Schulte in his backup version. Forensic experts will show you what he did. His digital fingerprints were all over it. They found his trail. Not really. And we also know that the CIA can manufacture that stuff. You know, that's kind of questionable in and of itself. Denton says you'll hear from Schulte's co-workers, covert operatives at the CIA. Oh, you, the co-workers that were drug dealing, those ones? Oh, okay. Schulte got the nickname Nuclear Option. His mounting anger at the CIA, the agency tried to address it. You'll see the log files. You'll watch defendant declare on video he wanted his supervisors to be punished, so maybe they should have been. You'll see him in jail on the phone. He wrote that he would break all of diplomatic relations. At the end of the trial, we'll talk to you again. For now, do three things. First, play, pay close attention. Follow for Judge Furman's instructions. Use your common sense. This man is guilty. Thank you. Now, defendant's opening statements. Schulte says the evidence does not fit. There is no information war. I did not commit these crimes. Good afternoon. My name is Joshua Schulte. I was born in 1988 in Texas. I worked at IBM. Then I wanted to serve my country. I was 12 years old on September 11, 2001. I applied to NSA and CIA after one semester. After successful background checks, I was hired in 2010. I assisted on a case to verify the location of Osama bin Laden. I then worked at Bloomberg LLP. I was there when WikiLeaks published. It was embarrassing for the CIA. They did not know when it was taken, how much, or who. They still don't know. Devlin was so insecure, it was nicknamed the Wild Wild West, with a password called My Sweet Summer that literally anyone could have figured out. The evidence will show that an individual, after Snowden's leaks, said it could happen to Devlin. It was impossible to find the leaker. They could not admit it to save face. They had to blame someone. They selected me as the patsy. The CIA told the FBI to go after me. This was a political witch hunt from day one. The government is manipulating the data. If you miss a day at work, they say you are committing a crime. It's spin and manipulation. This is the government's twilight zone. There were innocent explanations for everything. The first aspect of the government's fantasy is my motive. By 2016, sure, life had given me lemons, but I made lemonade. They say I was driven to insanity. I stood up for myself. When I lost, I moved on with my life. Why WikiLeaks? Why not just go on the internet to expose everything? WikiLeaks only published a small segment of it. This does not jibe with my personal um, with my loyal personality and patriotism. The government says I broke the rules of the CIA, but there were no rules on Devlin, but it was just a coworker using his access to power. They try to conflate servers and permissions. In reality, the back door was the front door. I would not have had to go back in time. It was all unsecure. They say the March 3rd, 2016 version was taken for emotional reasons. The computer I used at CIA was preserved. I could have wiped it. 
Their evidence proves my innocence. They have the logs. Not one was deleted. The commands were not executed, but they planned to convict me regardless of my innocence. Someone stole their crown jewels. It's not a good look for the CIA. The CIA workstation shows I only connected to one drive and connected it to a write blocker. My computer did not have the space to store the backups. That's reasonable doubt. My CIA workstation proves my innocence. Then they seized all my home computers. I had huge servers. These are my habits and hobbies. I stayed up late. I was playing an online game. The evidence will prove my innocence. They will wave a backup file in your face. They don't know which one was stolen. The government claims that WikiLeaks sat on the information for a whole year. Really? An organization that wants to spread news? Does the New York Times sit on a story for a year? You release it. The timeline doesn't make sense. Yes, I am incarcerated. These fine gentlemen here are marshals. You will see a lot of them. I have been in jail five years. You cannot know the pain. Judge Furman tells him to move on in the middle of his opening arguments. Like, what a... Uh, it's just so disrespectful. Okay, I was suffering from strain and anxiety. I wanted to publish the presumption of innocence, and it was. On Facebook then, the CIA reclassified things. Then they accused me of a thought crime. Orwell's 1984 was prophetic. My notebooks were labeled attorney-client privilege. The government cherry-picks the evidence to deceive you. The info war was about my unclassified redress of grievances, President Zelensky of Ukraine is likewise engaged in an information war to gain hearts and minds. Oh, <laughs> I asked the jury to realize how serious this trial is. Treat me as you'd like to be treated. The government will go first for everything. At the end in summation, they go first and last. You will find I am innocent. After five years, justice will be done. First witness is FBI agent Richard Evanchek. The U.S. attorney says, where do you work? He says, in, in Dallas, North Texas. Before that, I was in counterterrorism in a New York City counterintelligence squad six. We thwarted foreign government spying. And what was your role in investigating Joshua Schulte? Evan Check says, I was one of the lead FBI agents. Did you see Mr. Schulte? He is there. Or do you see him? He's there, white mask. He just waved, wearing a beard with a shaved head. Let's talk about March 7, 2017. Evan Check says, WikiLeaks released Vault 7. The impact was catastrophic. Our enemies knew our capabilities. Operations overseas were brought to a complete halt. Innovation was taken offline immediately or completely. Look at the item on the ledge next to you. Have you seen that item? Evan checks that. It's an HP laptop with a copy of the Vault 7 leak. Schulte, the defense objects. Um, Berman overrules Schulte's objection. U.S. Attorney Michael Lockard. What is here in Exhibit 2? Evan checks that. This is from the CIA documents leaked in Vault 7. It says CIA hacking tools revealed. USA Lockard, what is this? Evan Check says, this is the user guide to Brutal Kangaroo, the cyber tool. Evan Check reading, quote, to infect thumb drives, Brutal Kangaroo and Drifting Deadline, a CIA designed thumb drive that could infect others. This paragraph is classified as secret. Judge Furman says, what is the marking at the top? Evan Check, secret is the classification level. Then not for foreign dissemination, even an ally. Yeah, because we're spying on our allies and hacking them. Furman, jurors, some documents are declassified for this trial. There are other issues I'll describe as they come up. U.S. Attorney Lockard, what is this? Evan Check says the chain of command Schulte was under. Lockard says the stolen information was from the Cyber Center for Cyber Intelligence, the CCI. Evan Check says yes. Lockard, is the location of CCI undisclosed? Evan Check, yes, it is fortified. Evan Check, there was a full body uh, turnstile. You had to enter a unique identification pin. Lockard, where was the development branch? Evan Check on the eighth and ninth floor. Lockard, how did you get in? Evan Check, a unique card reader and pin for each vault. Lockard, let's turn to your investigation. Evan Check, it was a full investigation of Joshua Schulte with over 100 FBI agents, 1.4 petabytes of information unprecedented in FBI history. Oh, and they're not trying to entrap people into fake plots to kidnap the governor of uh, Michigan. <laughs> These bastards. Lockard, reading from a stipulation, quote, if called as a witness, a member of FBI card with knowledge of the matter, log these hard drives into evidence. Lockard, reading from stipulation, government exhibit 100. It's a CD with records of Joshua Adam Schulte, Jeremy Weber, Michael, government exhibit 115, Amal, <clears throat> the drug dealer. 
116 and the floor plan of the CCI portions of the defendant's CIA personnel files. 401 to 405 NDAs they had to sign in a letter of warning. Judge Furman says, ladies and gentlemen, sorry for stealing three minutes of your time. We'll pick up tomorrow. You heard CIA employees referred to by names, first names only, uh, or even other names altogether. It's uh, with my permission. If you get COVID, contact us. Okay, members of the public, please hold a few minutes to not run into the jurors. Can we get a preview of witnesses? Evan Check and Cross will take up much of tomorrow. And when will the sealed witnesses come? Mr. Schulte, you'll be taken to the skiff. Uh, please give the government your list. Also, you crossed the line in opening, essentially testifying. I want to warn you against it in your questioning. You need to ask questions like a lawyer, not a witness. Schulte says, I expect that documents will support me. Judge Furman says, it was firsthand testimonial. I'll leave it there until one of the jurors wants to speak with me. I'll bring it up tomorrow. Here's the initial email I sent to management uh, on October 31st, 2015, that describes many of the allegations. I just wanted to bring your attention to some alarming concerns regarding Officer Amal. These issues have occurred since his arrival about a year ago, diversity higher, but have only intensified and are now reaching a breaking point for me and my colleagues. Amal is very derogatory and abusive to everyone around him. On multiple occasions, he has gone so far as to wish death upon me and other colleagues such as Matthew. Specifically, he said, I wish you were dead. I want to piss on your grave. I want to dance on your grave. I wish you die in a fiery car crash and burn. I'd be so happy. I only say I wish you die because I really wish it were true, among others. Clearly, this type of rhetoric is inappropriate for an office environment and does little to foster collaboration. Despite many attempts by myself and others to ask him politely to stop, this abusive language continues daily. Additionally, Amal is especially abusive and vindictive when people ask for a reprieve or at least a halt in abuse regarding sensitive topics. For example, recently, Officer Michael was fitted with braces. Officers, including myself and Joshua F., warned Amal that Michael was sensitive about this topic and politely asked he not abuse this officer. Amal proceeded with daily insults fit for an elementary schoolyard, laughing at Michael and throwing insults at him such as train tracks and metal mouth. It's incomprehensible that a mature adult would ever behave in a cruel demeanor with complete disregard for others and lack of any empathy. No one is immune from Amal's insults, even people's wives. Amal has gone so far as to directly insult Jeremy Weber's wife and father-in-law. He has directly called them both dumbasses and idiots for their investment choice in the G Fund. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, okay, so... Let's see. I don't think there's anything else here we need to get into. We'll move on to the next one. This was June 15th in Vault 7 leak trial. Schulte crosses FBI agent on how secret CIA site has visitor center in Mike Pompeo. So the judge told him that he was doing better than they expected him to do, which is interesting. I think that's awesome. Schulte, on his own defense, engaged in the first cross-examination of FBI agent Evan Check. Judge Furman says, cross-examination. Schulte says, good afternoon. Mr. Evancheck says, hello, Mr. Schulte. Schulte, from the outset of your investigation, I was the only suspect. Evancheck says, you were the only one we could substantiate anything against. And Schulte says, you had unfettered access to Devlin, correct? Remember the Devlin system that was inside that vault-looking area? Evancheck says, yes. Schulte, you testified that the CCI office is in an undisclosed location. Correct? Evan Check says yes. Schulte, but DD1 is where the CIA brings all of its job applicants, right? Evan Check says that wasn't a topic of my investigation. So he doesn't actually know really anything. Schulte, you're saying the leak was from Confluence. Evan Check says, well, all but many of a page or two. Schulte says this is an important part of your investigation. I'm struggling to understand. You just don't remember or you never figured it out. Evan Check says, my involvement dwindled after our interactions. Schulte, so you just don't know. Evan Check says, I'll leave my testimony at what I've said. Schulte pulls up Government Exhibit 5-2. At the bottom here, it lists previous versions, correct? Evan Check says, it does. Schulte, so if WikiLeaks received the March 6, 2016 version, they could have selected the March 3rd version, correct? Assistant Attorney Lockard objects. Judge Furman sustains. Schulte says, were you aware that malware could change file times? Evan Check says, I'm not personally aware. Schulte says, did you ever speak with the director of the CIA about this case? Evan Check says, I was an earshot of a conversation. 
Shalti says, who was the director? Evan Check says, Mike Pompeo. Shalti, did you meet with the CIA on June 26, 2017? Evan Check says, I can't recall the dates. Shalti, do you recall the CIA telling you to go after me with everything? Oh. Evan Check says, I, I don't recall. Oh, please. This is a bullshit answer, folks. For people who don't know, when someone wants to give a bullshit non-answer, they say, I don't recall. I can't recall. Shulti, what are link messages? Evan checks as internal messages. Shulti, do you recognize this? Evan checks as it appears to be a transcript of instant message chats. Judge Furman, say the exhibit number. Make a record. Judge Shulti says, defense exhibit 101-1. I'd like to publish this to the jury. They object. The judge sustains. Shulti says, okay. Shulti, does it refresh your recollection about meeting with the CIA? Evan checks says, no. Shulti says, does it reflect... Ref refresh your recollection about going to Baltimore. <laughs> the U.S. Attorney objects that sustained. Um, he has to get better at learning to like ask these questions, like laying a foundation. You can't just go into Baltimore without first laying that foundation, but I think he's doing a good job. We met March 15th, 2017, correct? Evan Check says yes. Shalti, and you and Agent Donaldson took me to the Pershing Square Diner, right? Evan Check says yes. Shalti, did you give me a Miranda warning? Evan Check says no, we did not. Uh, jurors, this comes from Miranda versus Arizona. Shalti, did you say uh, this OIG email was classified? Evan Check says I did. And Shalti says there's a big difference. And Judge Furman says just ask a question. Shalti says do you not think that I simply misunderstood what you were talking about? They ob object. The judge sustains. Schulte, you did not record our interview, right? Evan Check says, I did not. Schulte, are you aware that nearly all police departments require body cam video? Yes, King, exactly. Why did the FBI get to just fill out these Form 302s that there's nothing like why why doesn't the fbi have to record video when they interrogate people they should have to do that all police officers have to wear body cams why and it's why we'll never find out what happened to eric alport a man that the fbi assassinated in broad daylight unless we this by some miracle there's cctv footage from the steakhouse he was leaving or something that caught that on camera but they have been suppressing their own internal investigation into that just to put that out there yeah so they object the judge sustains schulte so before you came to talk to me at bloomberg you selected pershing square diner correct evan check says i didn't personally choose it schulte says you had agents at pershing square and they could have set up video or audio right evan check says we could have the jury leaves mr schulte you're doing better than i might have expected for someone with no trial experience please ask standby counsel especially about refreshing recollection and getting exhibits in i see them handing you post-it notes so the trial will continue. Moving on to the next day, 16th, Schulte cites the Comey fiasco, then CIA Leonis in a sealed courtroom. Yes, this is amazing. I just love this stuff. On June 16, Schulte completes his cross-examination of FBI agent Evanchek. Then the U.S. put on CIA supervisor Anthony Leonis in a mostly sealed courtroom. So they bring in the, jur the jury... Um, they allow Mr. Schulte to proceed. Schulte says, good morning. Yesterday, you testified about the search of my Manhattan apartment. How many agents? Evan Check says, 8 to 15. How long did it take? Agent says, 14 to 15 hours. Schulte, for a one-bedroom apartment. Evan Check, yes. Schulte, you seized all the electronics. How many? Evan Check, two servers, desktops, thumb drives, hard drives. Schulte, there was no National Defense Information, NDI, discovered on my MP3 players, correct? Evan Check, not that I recall. Um, Judge Furman says, jurors, National Defense Information is a legal team. You'll decide it is or isn't. Schulte, was there any classification review by the CIA of the IRC chats? Evan Chat, I don't recall. Schulte, you seized 20 terabytes of data to try to find anything on me, correct? Evan Check, that is not the goal of our investigations. <laughs> oh, sure. Schulte, your search warrant for GitHub and Reddit, you found no national defense information, correct? Evan Check, no, we did not. Schulte, and here you found a movie, Robin Hood with Kevin Costner, correct? Evan Check, correct. Now, th I think that's an interesting thing he slipped in there, right? This Robin Hood movie. I don't know if that means anything, but I just find that interesting. Schulte, you said you found documents in the headboard of my bed, right? All my CIA documents. 
Evan Check says, most of them. Schulte says, like my CIA pay stubs. Answer, yes, Schulte. And just because an email has full names doesn't mean it's classified, right? Answer, it might be. Schulte, your notes here, they contain the last names of covert operatives of the CIA, correct? Evan Check says, well, just one. Schulte, but that's a violation, isn't it? Evan Check says, I'm not a classification authority. Schulte, did you just purposely disclose NDI? Oh, smack. I am, I love this. I just think this is fantastic. The U.S. attorney objects. <laughs> the judge sustains. Schulte. But the government never charged you with a crime, correct? Dang. All right, Schulte, let's talk about Google searches. Schulte, during this period, WikiLeaks released DNC emails, right? Evan Check, yes. Schulte, and there was a fiasco with your director, Comey, right? There was Guccifer 2.0, right? Judge Furman says, do you, do you know what Guccifer 2.0 is? And Evan Check says, no, sir. So he doesn't, an FBI agent doesn't even know about Guccifer, the whole fiasco that happened with that. How is this possible? Schulte says, there was also the shadow brokers. Is it your understanding? WikiLeaks has NSA code. Evan Check says, I don't know about that. How does he not know about this stuff if he's supposed to be investigating it? It's all connected. Schulte, did you know that 80% of the searches you claim I made about WikiLeaks were not in fact searches at all? Evan Check says no. Schulte, are you aware of Google News? Evan Check, I do not regularly use Google, so no. Schulte, did you know Google makes a special log in your search history when you're using Google News? Evan Check, no. Interim update one, the FBI surveilled Schulte's family vacation in San Diego. Jurgers look interested. Interim update two, Schulte went overtime with his cross and recross. Here's uh, some of it. Trial resumes with sealed session at 12.20 p.m. The FBI found people to wear wires and talk to Schulte about WikiLeaks. The FBI had people, quote unquote, bump into Schulte at a bachelor party and just, oh, by the way, bring up WikiLeaks and record him. Schulte made a point of asking, did the FBI surveil my mother and me going to Starbucks? Yes. Jurors look interested like it was a tennis match. Sealed session about to begin. A thread will continue later. Um, after being in the courtroom for two and a half hours, now it can be told the witness who cannot be physically described under the order is Anthony Leonis. He was Schulte's supervisor. He identified Schulte as the man with the shaved head. Mr. Leonis, on March 7, 2017, I was supposed to drive my boss. I was looking forward to the time to talk, but the Vault 7 leak came out on WikiLeaks and they said everyone to the office. There, the conference room was full. Brutal, brutal kangaroo could no longer be used. Assistant Attorney... Assistant U.S. Attorney Denton showed the screen Brutal Kangaroo Drifting Deadlines User Guide. Denton, what is air gap jumping? Leonis, a thumb drive infects one computer and it spreads onto another thumb drive. On the screen, easy cheese link files and giraffe links. Questioning turns back to the decision to relocate Schulte after he got a restraining order against them all. Email to Schulte, quote, as discussed, please move your cubicle. Emails involved Deborah, Bonnie B., Smith, Frank Stedman, Leonard Small, Patrick Schaefer. Then moving cubicles deemed not enough. Josh to AED slash RDB under Leonis, Amal AED slash MBD. Schulte responds with emails that he assumes this is punishment for reporting Amal and getting a protective order. He gets no written answer and writes again. Schulte was allowed to contribute to, but not administer, OSB libraries, but Leonis complains he still did and told Jeremy he'd been authorized. Alert Leonis says he began to consider stripping all of Schulte's access, a bureaucratic stations of the cross. Schulte did not get to start cross-examination of Leonis today. Denton says he has an hour more of direct, so 10 a.m. tomorrow. Moving on. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay. So let's see. Um, Leonis. He, this is Leonis. Josh told me he was going to fight back. It caught me off guard. He was going to put up a fight about a management decision. That's not the way people talk in a professional environment. What this really means is that the CIA is not used to being challenged by their own employees, right? When they, when they make decisions about stuff like this. The U.S. attorney says, did you ever retaliate against him? Leona says no. Assistant U.S. Attorney, Mr. Schulte wrote he has incurred the wrath of his supervisor, Karen. Karen was a Karen. How is Karen? 
CIA Leona's Karen cared so much about people, she'd walk the halls and ask about your family. We asked Josh and Amal to go to the Employee Assistance Program. This is not the kind of thing you want to deal with three weeks into a job as supervisor. I just wanted to help people build tools and collect intelligence for our country. U.S. Attorney is their classified info in this email. Leonis, the 3D graph, talks about developers. Leonis, and it talks about a vulnerability in one of our network, and it talks about Foreign Office West. So it gave the location, and it had the name of an undercover officer. So on my read, it is not unclassified. Judge Furman says, jurors, I approve the stipulation of the phrase Foreign Office West for the actual location, just so you understand. Leonis, after Vault 7 was published, we became a crime scene. The investigators brought cameras into the skiff, which was strange. Assistant U.S. Attorney, no further questions. Schulte says, good morning. Leona says, good morning. Schulte says, didn't I have a great relationship with my management before you? Leona says, I can't say. Mr. Schulte says, you didn't have my file? Leona says, no. Mr. Schulte says, I was promoted every year until my last year, right? Leona says, I don't know. Schulte, you didn't have access to promotion records? Leona says, I don't remember. Oh, I can't recall. Schulte, but you began keeping a dossier, says the R on me in a white binder, right? Leona, no. Uh-oh. Schulte, you never kept a white binder? Leonis, later we did. Shalti, before you became manager at the CIA, where did you work before? They object. Had you ever managed people? Leonis says no. Oh, shit. Shalti, did you ever get training on conflict re resolution? CIA Leonis says, I had experience in getting people to sit down and talk. Oh, okay. Yeah, what kind of experience was that? Interrogations? Shalti, just hash things out when Jeremy Weber wrote to you, not copying me. Did you know he had stopped talking with me? Leona says no. Schulte, so this email that Mr. Weber sent, Leona says Mr. Weber should not have sent that email. Schulte says, so that's overreaching. Let's go to 1062. Mr. Weber is escalating the issue directly to you, correct? Leona says, I'm in his management chain. Schulte says, you never asked me my side of the story, right? CIA Leona says, I needed more information. Schulte says, I'm sorry, sir. Just answer yes or no. Leona says, no. Oh, damn. He just told that CIA guy, just answer yes or no. <laughs> I love this. Schulte says, you could have called a meeting between us and resolved it. And Leona says, I needed info first. CIA's Leona says, my concern was who had admin privileges to the library. Schulte, what does that entail? Leona's control over the libraries, being able to change or modify things. Schulte, but you also said everyone has the ability to do that, to write code. Schulte, so on April 18, you begin to write the memo of warning, right? CIA Leona says, no. Schulte says, you didn't. Leona says, it was a memorandum. Schulte says, you wrote it without even speaking with me, right? So that's interesting. Like, they just didn't like this guy, it seems like, because he was kind of challenging their fucking decisions. Leona says, we were going to talk with you about it. Schulte says, the question is, you had decided on April 18th you were going to issue me the memorandum. Leona says, yes, but then we were going to have a conversation. Schulte, but HR wasn't even there, right? CIA's Leona says, I think they were there. Schulte, but they didn't sign the memorandum as a witness. Aren't they supposed to sign the memo? They have, the U.S. attorney objects, and that is sustained. Schulte, did you know that the Atlassian tools were installed by Patrick? Oh. <laughs> That's objected to and sustained. Schulte, this cutoff had only to do with Atlassian and no other servers like IRC, right? They object, that sustained. It speaks for itself, Mr. Schulte. Schulte, are you aware of Dave D, who worked in RDB? The CIA's Leona says, I don't know how to answer your question. Schulte says with a yes or a no. <laughs> Leona says, I'm aware of Dave. Schulte, and he moved. Leona says, yes. Judge Furman says, okay, we'll take our break. Don't discuss the case. Uh, you may proceed. Schulte says, good afternoon. Before testifying, you met with Assistant U.S. Attorney Denton 15 times, correct? CIA's Leona says, last maybe 10. Schulte, some lasted several hours, right? Leonis, maybe two hours. Schulte, brutal kangaroo is the project, right? CIA's Leona says, it is the tool suite. Schulte, 
Shattered assurance is one of the tools that and uses drifting deadline, right? Leona says that's what it says here. Judge Sherman says, I think we've covered this. Schulte, let's talk about weekly activity reports. Did I submit mine to you? Leona says, yes. Schulte says, I'd like to read this. Judge Furman says, don't, it's an evidence, move on. With the jury out of the room, Furman urged Schulte to finish his cross of Leonis today. Leonis says, shattered assurance was inside brutal kangaroo. It was your job to, and he says, I object, judge. <laughs> Overruled, Schulte. I move to introduce the stipulation 3008. Uh, Furman says, you don't have to read the first paragraph. I'm giving you 15 or 20 minutes more. Schulte, can we have a sidebar? The judge says, no, let's do this more quickly. That's like, he's being treated very disrespectfully by this judge. You know, he's doing his best to like act as his own lawyer. He's never had trial experience before and he's going up against the entire federal government. You know, it's just ridiculous. The level of disrespect by the judge. That, by the way, he would have afforded an attorney. Schulte says, I want to talk about the fight back statement. Is there not a formal way for CIA employees to fight back? CIA Leona says, fight back is not language we use, but there are mechanisms to address concerns. Schulte says, did you know that through the CIA's formal process, my performance report par was modified? Leona says, no. Schulte, how do you characterize my demeanor at the meeting? Leona says, you were frustrated. Schulte, when was the first time you talked to me about access to Brutal Kangaroo? Leona says, we set all projects. Schulte, but project were, trans were transferred with me. CIA Leona says, you were told which projects uh, you could take with you. Schulte, it never said Brutal Kangaroo. Judge Herman says, Mr. Schulte, you may not testify. After a long sidebar, Schulte says, okay, I want to talk about security. Did you know that the CCI site was a uh, SC0 site? That's objected to. Furman says, just say yes or no. CIA Leona says, yes. Schulte, and what does that mean? That's objected to. Schulte, the CIA interviews and tests applicants there, right? Uh, the, Leona says, I don't know. Um, and then the uh, U.S. attorney says, Your Honor, we're getting into the issue that came up the other day. Schulte says, may stand by counsel, hand a copy. They object. They're sidebar again. Schulte says, I want to ask you about Devlin. Have you heard it described as the wild, wild west? Leona says, no, never heard about that. Schulte says, did you know that a developer put the stash back up on a public page? Leona says, no. So here they're putting backups of the entire Devlin system on a public page because that they were so insecure, this system. Schulte says, is it CIA policy to basically close up shop after a leak? U.S. Attorney objects that sustained. Schulte, are you aware of the WikiLeaks task force? CIA Leona says yes, but I was not party to it. Okay, um, so no redirect or anything like that. And then it moves on um, to yesterday, uh, not yesterday, a couple days ago. This is just really, I think people need to understand how amazing this is. On June 21st, Meter and now Microsoft's Patrick Leadham did direct and then some cross-examination by Schulte. So they come back, the government proceeds. U.S. Attorney says, good morning, remind us what did Schulte do? Microsoft's Patrick Leadham. He reverted to an earlier date, then I investigated the network. The FBI was making forensic images. Assistant U.S. Attorney, how did you come to focus on Schulte? Lead him. It's all starting to point back. It all started pointing back to him. When we reviewed his machines and his logs, we found some very suspicious things. U.S. Attorney says, let's put up the chart and compare what WikiLeaks published to Mr. Schulte's logs. U.S. Attorney, what's the difference between a desktop and a server? Microsoft's lead him says a server is in Iraq. It is basically a beefy desktop. U.S. Attorney, what type of operating system ran on Devlin. Leadham says Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. U.S. Attorney, we offer this chart of Devlin into evidence. There's no objection to that. U.S. Attorney, did you review what WikiLeaks published? Leadham, I did the actual web pages. U.S. Attorney, where did the March 7 leak come from? Leadham says the March 3 confluence backup. U.S. Attorney, how do you know? Leadham says the command was missing an argument. U.S. Attorney, let's look at what was posted on WikiLeaks. What is this? Leadham says, a page from the Vault 7 release. U.S. Attorney, did it appear as it would have on Confluence on Devlin? Leadham says, yes. Leadham, WikiLeaks has its own font and color, but that's superficial. The information is the same. I don't go, I didn't go through the page relationship or navigation directory. U.S. Attorney, what conclusions did you draw? Leadham, it made it easier to figure out how they stole it. Leadham, we know this 165 is Schulte's workstation. 
Here he requests administrative access to OLB libraries as Shul Joe, U.S. attorney. Does some person have to take an action to generate the event? Leadham says since he had the permissions, it was automatic. Judge Furman says, Mr. Denton, would this be a natural place to stop? Yes, so the juries take... They take a break, they come back in. Schulte says, I want to note, depending on how the government, once they get a chance to look at the letter I sent them, there may be need to introduce the classified exhibit on cross. The judge says, that's not happening this afternoon. <laughs> the U.S. attorney says, did this session by Mr. Schulte eventually end? Leadham says, yes, he logged out at 147. U.S. attorney, do you see where he said all private keys have been destroyed? Leadham says, yes, but he was still using them. U.S. attorney, any activity with regard to the March 3 backup? Leadham, yes, they were accessed April 20th. Then he, as administrator, deleted log files, not normal. Judge Furman, could you just explain for the basis for that testimony? Leadham says, only delete when out of space. Leadham says, having worked on cases where people nefariously hack in, Schulte objects, that's overruled. U.S. Attorney, did the defendant revert to that snapshot right away? Leadham said he had to create a new one first, but eventually, yes, a client on his workstation was used to make this at 5.29 p.m. on April 20th. Leadham says, it's my opinion, these files were copied by the defendant. A U.S. Attorney says, how do you know this? WikiLeaks, uh, Leadham says, WikiLeaks published these exact files. Schulte objects, and that is overruled, because he doesn't know the proper way to object. Like, he's not saying why he's objecting. He's just objecting. But I don't think the judge grants him any of his objections anyways, and the judge seems to be sort of an ass. Lead him. It seems Mr. Schulte was using a scorched earth approach, just deleting all the log files and not just the juicy ones. U.S. Attorney, what do you conclude? Lead him that the, the log deletions were successful. They have no further questions for him, and now it goes to cross-examination. Schulte says, hello. Slide 89. These are your forensic findings, correct? Mr. Leadham says, yes. Schulte, you stay in bullet one. Schulte, use, but in bullet two, you just say they were accessed, right? Mr. Leadham says, yes. Schulte says, these were based on logs you retrieved from my CIA workstation, right? Leadham says, yes. Schulte says, but my workstation would have not been impacted from the reversion, right? Mr. Leadham says, I don't understand. Schulte says, you met with the prosecutors to prepare, right? Leadham says, yes. Schulte says, it was flattering to be picked to work on this case. Leadham says, it was. And Schulte says, raise your profile in the MITRE Corporation, meter, MITRE, whatever. I'm probably getting it wrong. Leadham says, in some ways, Schulte says, now you're at Microsoft. So yeah, he sort of has got, gotten promoted from this. Answer, yes. Schulte, DOJ is paying for your hotel. Leadham says, yes. Schulte, you had lunch with the prosecutors. Leadham laughs and says, yes, I did. Schulte says, you prepared your slides with Mr. Denton. Leadham says, yes, I did. Schulte, you had complete access to the Devlin machines, right? Leadham, yes. Schulte, but you didn't recognize many of the CIA tools, right? Leadham says, right. Schulte, so someone else would have been more qualified. <laughs> and that's objected to and sustained. Schulte, do you recall that the government said it must have happened on March 7th? Leadham says, I'm a bit blurry on that. So the government told him what to say. Oh, I'm a little blurry on that. That's the same as I don't recall. Schulte says, where did the FBI get that date? Leadham says, I don't remember. Schulte says, were you involved in that analysis? And Leadham says, I was in transition. Schulte says, did you review the security of Devlin? Leadham says, yes. Schulte, how was it security? Leadham says, below average. <laughs> oh, you think? Password. One, two, three, A, B, C, DEF in my sweet summer. Schulte, did you research the permission to access Stash? Mr. Leadham says, I didn't really work on that specifically. So again, how is he qualified to comment on this stuff? Schulte says, did you know that Stuxnet was all over Devlin? And that is objected to, they call a sidebar. Schulte, would they know if someone just downloaded information onto a thumb drive? Mr. Leadham says, I don't know. I can't speak to that. So then they call it a day after that. Absolutely insane. Judge Furman says to Lehman, sorry, you'll be here longer, but you're being compensated. Furman says, Mr. Schulte came close to saying he wasn't given any forensic images as a curative instruction needed. Um, the attorney says there's a problem with Mr. Schulte saying, were you aware? It's like he's testifying. No, it's not. They're, he, they're just being assholes because they're pissed that this is happening the way that it is happening, you know? So it resumes today, day six, 
with Leadem again. Schalte's at the podium, five feet from Juror 6, with two laptops, post-it notes from standby counsel on screen, Palo Alto firewall from Hickok server. Schulte says, do you have a contact in WikiLeaks? <laughs> the U.S. objects and the judge sustains it. Schulte says, both friendly and unfriendly nations run cyber operations against each other, right? That is objected to and overruled. Mr. Leadham says, I can't really speak to foreign policy. Note, an alternate juror is sleeping. <laughs> Schulte is zeroing in on my SQL dump command. Leadham says, this is a hypothetical scenario. Okay, they're back from break. Uh, Judge Furman told Schulte to speed it up or he will shut him down. They, you know, it's so rude. They never say that to the U.S. attorneys. Schulte says, you know, working at the CIA is not a nine-to-five job, right? Leadham says, right. Schulte says, I move to introduce this exhibit, 1207. That's objected to and sustained. Okay, the script command is the one that generates files like these, right? Objected to and sustained. Judge Furman asks for a sidebar. Um... Schulte says, you testified I deleted log files on the uh, ESXi server, correct? And Liedem says, correct. Schulte says, no further questions at this time. So that goes to a redirect. And the U.S. attorney says, uh, Mr. Schulte asked you if material had been deleted from his CIA workstation and you referred to a host. Um, Mr. Liedem says, yes, says Devlan, using Windows with a virtual machine. Now, guys, this is up to date. As of four minutes ago, this is still ongoing. I just wanted to provide a rundown so far that this man, Mr. Schalte, is literally going up against the CIA, the Department of Justice, like by himself. He's acting as his own freaking attorney at this point. He's representing himself. It is pretty amazing. It's pretty ballsy. So now you have some background on that. And I will continue to provide updates in this new retrial of Mr. Schulte, and we'll see what happens. But I do not think that the government has a very strong case against Mr. Schulte. And I, I presume that this isn't going to go as well for them as they think it's going to go. With Mr. Schulte representing himself, I just think that this is fascinating and the more people should be talking about this. Anyways, let me know what you guys think of this. Have you heard of this, uh, the Vault 7 case? Are you following it? Are you familiar with Joshua Schulte and like all of the issues here? Was this video helpful going back in time and kind of giving people the prior information to the old hearing that's, well, by the way, it was two years ago now. So he's been in prison for five years over this so far. And we don't know if he did it at all or if they just didn't like him and decided to make him a patsy. But anyways, um, like, share, subscribe, if you will. And if you want to support my work, there are links in the video description and all of the sources that I've used. I'll have all that stuff linked as well so you guys can look at this stuff um, on your own. Ring!